Street, no? Uh, I'm very welcome. Um, I'm very glad and honored to introduce Professor Bianchini, who, of course, doesn't need to be introduced to most of you. Um, we are going to have a longer discussion about Professor Bianchini's new book, which he can kindly show you. This is the only copy we can... This is my copy, yeah. <laughs> only my copy. <laughs> a very recently published uh, book, and this is self-ironically, of course, famous be also because he, he kind of synthesized, he wrote part of the chapters here in Kursag in 2014 and 15, when he was a fellow, a research fellow, uh, one of the first ones, um, then we were not yet an institute, we were just um, a foundation, but we were preparing to become an institute. So, but we have been working together with Stefano since 1990. And I don't give you the whole story, it's an interesting story how we met in Sussex um, after the collapse of Yugoslavia. It's a good story for tomorrow. For today, I, <laughs> I had the pleasure to announce that this is the first lecture in a series which is about the future of Europe in global context, from Voltex, um, <clears throat> which is also a module for our international studies MA program. So here, Stefano, you have students who are enrolled, uh, students of the University of Pannonia, and you have researchers, if I ask, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of an experimentation where in a small academic environment, um, students and more senior academics are together and listening to you, and, um, and some, some others who come. It's about a lecture series of eight to 10 lectures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also the, 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 the novelty is also that it's, it's publicized, published online. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will be a, um, an edited version. We put on the web um, by tomorrow or so. Okay. So your students can watch it What's retrospectively <laughs> if they want to. Uh, in Bologna, you know, Professor Biakin is also teaching a course, not a course, an MA course, but he established his MA in Sarajevo yeah. about human rights. So he's a very, very known researcher of the former Yugoslav societies, if you want the Balkans, uh, who also lived there and who speaks most of the languages. Uh, so please uh, listen to him as a historian, but probably he would introduce himself as a political scientist. It's up to you, Stefano. The floor is yours. So, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ferenc, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for everybody because we know partially uh, each other already for the activities that have been done here in Kursig uh, when Kursig was still an institute before I ask. I assume that because of the uh, website, uh, I have to stay here, I have not to move. Correct? Is it correct? No, because I'm used to walk. Uh, and so this is the reason why I was asking. Ah, okay. Ah, it's there, the camera. I see, I see. Yes. I, I was, uh, I was uh, frightened that because of the microphone. Okay, okay, okay no, good. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it's good. And uh, what I want to say is... Uh, uh, that um, this book that uh, we are going also to discuss tomorrow is uh, actually the uh, result of a two years of research that I conducted here. So without uh, the period that I spent here in, uh, in Kurseg, this book will never be published. Uh, will, I would never have uh, the time even to write it. So I have to, I'm very grateful to uh, Kurseg uh, and, uh, and Ferenc and all this organization because they made possible to, to achieve this, uh, this goal for me. And uh, well, uh, the topic of my lecture, as you know, is uh, uh, why is nationalism a liquid uh, uh, ideology? And uh, as you know, nationalism is a European idea. It's a European idea that has been then transferred uh, to other continents thanks to the colonial empires and the expansion of Europe outside, the, outside its own continent. 
But at the same time, I raised this issue uh, about the liquid nationalism because I was uh, particularly uh, attracted by uh, the uh, definition of uh, Sigmund Bauman about the liquid modernity. Uh, when he was speaking about uh, the uh, possibility of uh, uh, considering that uh, modernity in that case, because he was speaking modernity, is uh, uh, breaking, is melting, let's say, uh, like the ice is melting in water, is melting uh, the uh, social links, pre-existing social links, the pre-existing habits, and transforming that into new solid body. Well, I think that this interpretation of modernity is perfectly uh, connected also to the idea of nationalism. Because the idea of nationalism is something that is very complex, uh, comprehensive, and uh, very uh, di diversified according to the time, according to the interpretation. Uh, so you can, you can put uh, so many things together within, uh, within uh, the idea of nationalism. Just to give you an example, uh, you can uh, uh, nationalism as a, uh, produce uh, different impacts. There are no doubts. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, it can be, uh, it creates a, a condition for the unification <coughs> of territories or their own secession. So both. It offered the opportunity for speaking about freedom and it offered the opportunity to uh, oppress minority or even to uh, emphasize the superiority of uh, one specific uh, group of people over the others and to uh, support racism, xenophobia, uh, ethnic cleansing, for instance, all these kind of violences and atrocities. But at the same time, there are no doubts that democracy was developed within the framework of the uh, national state, which doesn't imply the contrary, that the, the national states uh, encouraged democracies, because we know that national state also uh, created opposite conditions. For instance, think about, uh, about Nazi Germany and what uh, was connected to Nazi Germany in terms of nationalism and the superiority of the Aryan, uh, Aryan uh, uh, people and so on and so forth. So, uh, if you look from this point of view, you have so many transformations about uh, and so many impacts about the idea of nationalism that it seems to me that uh, uh, according to the different interpretation, this offer a clear uh, idea how fluid is uh, the notion in itself. And uh, how can this be interpreted differently according to uh, different contexts. Of course, I have several examples to show, uh, to, to, to speak about this. Uh, just to give you uh, a, 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 some examples that started from the beginning of the development of the idea of nationalism. The idea of nationalism at the beginning was an idea of uh, uh, revolutionaries, uh, people that were opposing the tyrannies, in brackets I'm saying, because uh, I have some doubt that we can consider the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, a tyranny in itself, but this was the perception. And so, uh, from this point of view, you can have a, a, a movement that was uh, claiming the freedom of peoples, but you have also nationalism as a state ideology. As a state ideology that justified the power politics, justified the uh, colonial empires and the, uh, and the great powers policies. So how can this uh, ideology be uh, adapted to uh, the uh, opposition circles and at the same time uh, to be a part of state ideology? that justify power politics and military policies. So uh, all these elements gave to me the idea that this is an ideology that uh, is able several times to, uh, to melt the uh, pre-existing uh, social links, the pre-existing habits, 
the uh, pre-existing pre uh, self-awareness of the individuals and of the groups to transform them in some, something else as a solid body, which doesn't imply that this solid body, at a certain point, under new conditions, historical conditions, social conditions, economic conditions, can... I had the suspicion. <laughs> I had the suspicion that... <laughs> uh, the, the, the microphone <laughs> was uh, meta <laughs> matters. <laughs> and it is not so liquid. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I wanted to say that uh, for this reason, this kind of uh, uh, of process that uh, uh, creates new bodies at a certain point under new conditions, historical conditions, social conditions, economic conditions, can again melt into something else. Just to give you one general example. It was the process of creating first an empire and a national state that established Spain as a national state. And now you have, so imagine all the process that led, for instance, uh, through the changes in terms of habits, uh, cultures, uh, perception, self-perception of the Spaniard to become members of Spain, uh, Spain. And then suddenly you have another group of people within Spain that through new condition is melting the idea of the national state of Spain and is uh, promoting a new, uh, let's say, solid body that is uh, the, uh, for Catalonia, for instance, this is one case, or the uh, Pais, Pais Vascos, the Basque country. This is just to give you an example. Uh, similarly, for instance, you can have uh, in Corsica, no one today uh, considered, particularly in the newspapers, in the journals, that uh, in Corsica the independentist uh, movement got the uh, local elections. And they speak about the Corsican nation. What do they think about the Corsican nation now is a matter of question and should be discussed because not necessarily the idea they have as a nation is corresponding to the Macron idea of nation or even of Marie Le Pen nation, idea of nation. And so you see here how fluid is this perception. And this probably explain also why is uh, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, this idea show a great adaptability to different contexts because it is like, like a mutant, let's say, able to adapt itself under these different conditions. But imagine, for instance, uh, it was very interesting to me to uh, make uh, a comparative analysis in these terms between the, the way how the uh, Yugoslav self-perception, the Serb and the Croat self-perceptions evolved in 150 years together with uh, a similar development, very similar development, between uh, the idea of the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth and the uh, Polish nationalism and Lithuanian nationalism. If you look from this point of view, there are lots of similarities. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, again, when the uh, Commonwealth uh, between Poland and Lithuania, which include also included at that time part also of Belarus and uh, Ukraine, dissolved because it was, uh, it was partitioned, and this was one of probably the uh, first modern partitions that we had in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe, the, uh, the idea how to reconstruct Poland became one of the key issues for particularly the uh, aristocracy that organized the uprisings. Why? But because to a large extent this aristocracy was uh, polonized which was very similar to the fact that the Croatian aristocracy was majorized. And, uh, and in Serbia, there was no aristocracy at all because the aristocracy, Serbian aristocracy served directly the Ottoman Empire and was not aristocracy at all. 
So from, from this point of view, you see the different uh, national, uh, I would say social groups that look differently at the future of the country. In, in the case of Poland, for instance, Czartoryski was one of the key figures uh, that in the 19th century promoted the, the idea of restoring the independence of Poland into Europe and particularly in Western Europe where the sense of culprits toward the fact that Poland was abandoned uh, was developed. Yeah? Uh, well, Czartoryski was from a Lithuanian family by origin, but he was a Polish. And uh, when he elaborated the, uh, his ideas about restoring the Poland, he had in mind the idea of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the reestablishing the Commonwealth. But meanwhile, while he was thinking about that, he was creating projects, uh, he was involving even Serbia in, uh, in uh, this kind of project in order to organize a double uprising, one in the south uh, led by Serbia against the Otto, uh, Austrian Empire, at the time still Austrian, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the Polish uh, uh, soldiers that would uh, uh, create the uprising in Poland-Lithuanian space, such a way that the Austrian Empire should be defeated in, in his uh, hopes when he was thinking about uh, all these issues. Well, at the same time in Lithuania, there were other processes that were de developing in terms of, of uh, uh, teaching the local languages, uh, creating, creating a, a system even of uh, introducing illegally uh, uh, in Lithuania books uh, in Lithuanian languages printed from abroad that were uh, in such a way uh, creating the condition for uh, thinking that Lithuania is something different from the uh, Polish space. And there were Polish uh, scholars like Dmowski, for instance, that were thinking that their own interest of Poland was not to recreate the, the Commonwealth, but to separate clearly the uh, Polish dimension with the Lithuanian dimension. And what was the outcome of all these developments? That a war occurred between Poland and Lit Lithuania as soon as the two groups became independent. So from this point of view, you see that there, was a, there were ideas of how to reestablish a certain, a certain joint framework and how the dynamics created new, uh, new social links, new, uh, new habits, new, uh, new uh, I, I would say, uh, self-awareness of the individuals and the groups to such an extent that for some, uh, some of them, there was still the basis for unifying the groups and for others to separate them. Similarly, was for the Yugoslav Serbo-Croatia dimension. Here, even worse, in a sense, because you needed the two wars instead of one to divide the two groups, the Serbs and the Croats, and to annihilate completely the idea of Yugoslavia, so of a state that was uh, putting together all the South Slavs. But there were plenty of ideas how this South Slav state had to be set up in the 19th century. Just to give you an example, probably you know that uh, some, some South Slav peoples uh, use the Latin alphabet and some others, uh, South Slavs, using the, uh, the Cyrillian alphabet. I didn't mention the peoples uh, not by chance, uh, just uh, using two different alphabets. Well, there was a Slovenian scholar, Jan Metelko, who in, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century invented a joint alphabet where to use both the, uh, the letters from the Latin and the, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, um, Cyrillian, Pravoslav, <laughs> Cyrillian <laughs> alphabet alphabet to, uh, together just because he had in mind to connect from Slovenia to Bulgaria all the peoples of South Stars. So uh, there, uh, even in the 18th century, there were people that wrote, for instance, books, both Croats and Serbs, the Croats speaking that 
all the Croats, all those speaking a certain dialect were Croats, which included also the Serbs and the Bosniaks, and vice versa. Serbs that were thinking that all the people that were speaking the same dialect were Serbs. Think, for instance, even uh, one of the leader of uh, the, that is today considered the uh, father of the Croatian nation, Star, Ante Starcevic, he was thinking that the Serbs were simply Orthodox Croats. And what was interesting is that very often these people that tried to divide, I mentioned Dumovsky before and Starcevic later, were anti Semitic. Their own anti-Semitism was very interesting, by the way. Uh, Mosky became anti-Semitic anti because he considered the Jews allies of Germany, think the paradox of history, allies of Germany to destroy the Polish nation. And for this reason, he advocated even the boycott of the products in Poland of the Jewish shops. Starcevich was thinking that the uh, Jew, uh, Jewish people were amoral because cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan. And because they were cosmopolitan, they could not be loyal to a nation. So if you look from this point of view, this was the, the kind of interpretation. And what is the paradox? In most of these cases, lots of people at that time was, uh, were used to have double name and surname. This was true for the Serbs and, and the Croats. For instance, the Croats had very often, even the Serbs, the uh, Hungarian name and the, uh, and the uh, Serbian name. But even the, the father of the uh, Hungarian literature, yeah? Sandor Petefi, uh, actually uh, he was from a family, Petrovic, because his father was Serb and his mother uh, was Slovak. Because the, what I mean, you see here the complexity, the mixture of the, uh, of the uh, origins and then the way how the person elaborated their own self evidence. This is not something that is coming from, uh, from let's say, from natural events, but it's a free choice. And uh, similarly, you have uh, among, between the uh, Lithuanians and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the Polish people, because lots of people, including uh, Czartoryski, including uh, lots of, uh, of uh, known uh, authors, uh, uh, even Nobel Prize, like Czeslav Milos, for instance, they had the double names and surnames. So, how can you establish the line when uh, suddenly uh, you have the nation that pretend to establish that I'm this person and you are that person. I belong to this group, you belong to that group. I, uh, in, in, this, in this moment, when this happens and how this can evolve. Look, this is more or less what, uh, this is a, a long process that affected different periods of the history of Europe, and not only of Europe, because then these ideas were transferred into other continents. But if you look from this point of view, thinking about our, uh, our uh, societies, even today, think, for instance, of the transformation of our society today. Well, we are facing Brexit. We are thinking about how to reintegrate Europe a core, no? The political say are speaking about the core. How to develop a common memory? If we have a common memory, this means that we have also something to share. And actually, the German uh, German policymakers created a home of a European memory in Brussels, which is very interesting and was highly criticized by. Uh, Feel, uh, mainstreams uh, in uh, East Central Europe for several different interpretations of what the memory is in, uh, in this case and uh, what, to what extent nationalism is included or excluded from this process of memory as an ideology, as became, as in, not as a, an historical process because there are two different things in the, from this point of view. And you see, we have to make always distinction and this, again, 
give us arguments why we are speaking about a fluid idea that can change uh, very often into, into the uh, historical framework. So, uh, for instance, we are now facing Brexit, but not only Brexit. We are facing, for instance, uh, the crisis in Ukraine. The fact that uh, on, the, uh, on uh, behalf of uh, protecting uh, the Russian minorities abroad, Putin incorporated Crimea into Russian Federation. We are speaking about Catalonia and uh, the future of Spain, despite of the fact that may, maybe Mariano Rajoy uh, would like not to, to consider uh, any kind of future that, uh, uh, different than that of the Spain, uh, Sp uh, Spanish kingdom at, uh, as, as such as it is today. So uh, this is something that is without, uh, within a process, again, where uh, lots of elements are put under fluidity, as Zygmunt Bauer was speaking about. So when you see that uh, the, uh, the sense of, the, of belonging to a group is put under question. And one of the main characteristics of, uh, of this element to be part of the group is the sense of homogeneity. It can be cultural homogeneity, historical homogeneity, language homogeneity, which is already something that leads to lots of discussion because we are speaking at that point about the process of standardization of certain vernacular that has been declared a, a, a national language. You can see here so the, the process imaging just to give you an example, the language that uh, I'm used to speak with my wife and my daughter yeah, is called Italian language. Well, this Italian language has been established by only one person, only one person in 1868, not far away, <laughs> uh, when the new minister for university of the new kingdom of Italy invited a famous Italian novelist that we students had to read and study and we found very boring when we were at school at this matter. Uh, that, uh, uh, and he was asked to write the first Italian grammar. He decided, this novelist, decided that the, uh, the Italian standard language should be a dialect between Rome and Siena. He wrote the, the grammar, and this grammar was introduced into the newly established compulsory elementary school of the first and second year. In this way, the people learned, because they were speaking different vernaculars, and I can tell you very different in, in, in lots of, uh, of words, and, uh, and even the, in the grammar structure, and they had to learn this in order to started to work in the factories, or even for the male to serve in the military. And the military was another vehicle, together with the school, where the language was standardized. So this is just to give you an example. Uh, <coughs> but this was followed by everybody, more or less, in Europe. So the need to establish a German common language, the, the idea of establishing a common Serbo-Croatian language and so on and so forth, was a following more or less similar example, just to establish a uh, standardized language. And all these elements now are melting. I don't know how many people here are uh, English mother tongue. May I ask? One, two. One, mother, mother, mother tongue, English mother tongue, three. <laughs> English. Maybe. <laughs> Three people. All the others not. Me included. So we are using English as... This is for because he doesn't know. He doesn't know. English, yeah. So three, four. But no, uh, no one from among the young generation, the youngest generation here. So what I want to say is that this was unconceivable 30 years ago. When I was a student, it was impossible, absolutely impossible, to have a classroom of people that were coming from different countries and they used 
a third language in order to communicate each other. When I was a student, we were speaking in Italian, we were in the classroom where everybody was from Italy, maybe after 1968, uh, with an exception, we received Greek students that didn't want to accept the uh, dictatorship of the generals, they didn't want to serve the military, but they learned Italian, and they attended their the classes into Italian, period. And there were no possibility to take a, a flight and to go to Budapest, for instance, to come to Kursk. This was a, a dream that we didn't even have, <laughs> something that didn't exist. So I'm telling you because just to, to calculate, only 30 years have passed. And now that idea, for instance, that we are homogeneous, we had this history of Italian history, now it's melting. <coughs> it's melting because uh, we are using uh, more languages, and you are particularly requested to, to speak more languages if you want to have a career. Otherwise, you, you will remain confined in your countryside and in the rural areas. There are no doubts about that. Uh, the, the fact that medicine is changing dramatically the context. And, uh, and this is, a, for instance, this has an impact in the idea of the family, in the way how, uh, how you manage, you manage the, uh, the health care uh, and the all the uh, human relationships, because medicine has a great impact. Imagine the height, the, uh, the high speed, and uh, that is connected to, 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 to trains, or the fact that we have low cost flights, or even internet, and the new technologies. When you sit down uh, on your chair and you communicate with Australia, and you are in Hungary, so you cross the borders without moving. Even. This was something impossible 30 years ago, but even 20 years ago. So this explains to you again why I'm speaking that we are, uh, we, we are testing a uh, liquid transformation of our society once again. So there was the period when solid bodies were established during the period of the great empires uh, at the time, I'm speaking 15th, 16th century, in Europe, 17th century. Then you have, we had the French Revolution, the French Revolution contributed, and the Enlighteners contributed a lot in uh, uh, melting the old uh, notions, taking into consideration that uh, Enlightenment had a great impact in East Central Europe, particularly on culture, particularly on culture and languages. And all these elements, elements made fluid the, the context and create the new context, new geopolitical context <coughs> that is based on, the, on what we were used to call national state. But we were used to call national state Czechoslovakia. And who is now uh, ready to think that Czechoslovakia is a national state? But in the constitution of 1918, 1919, so, so the, after the Masaryk, included into the constitution that in Czechoslovakia people speak Czechoslovak, which is something that uh, would not be accepted today. But this explains to you why this, but because they had another example, the example of the fact that in 10 years, 10, 11 years, between 1859 and 1870, two big states were established suddenly in Europe, Italy and Germany. And so it was obvious that this uh, uh, elaborate new imaginations uh, among the Czechs and Slovaks, among the Polish and uh, uh, South Slavs uh, peoples, because they were thinking just to imitate this. Then, because of the elements that I have already mentioned, the ideas, different idea of what a nation is, and even the way how to interpret the group, you had also parallel interpretation that were developed at the same time. And then, and then for this reason, you had uh, under certain conditions when uh, the context allowed that. For instance, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you had the collapse of the federations, of the socialist federation in Europe. So no more Yugoslavia, no more Czechoslovakia, no more Soviet Union. 
no more federations from this point of view. Only Switzerland remained. My, uh, this was not a communist, a socialist country. Uh, <laughs> so, if you look from, from this, uh, this point of view, Spain transformed, accepted a certain uh, decentralization uh, and accepted the idea of nation <coughs> in cultural terms, but not in political terms. When Catalonia tried to introduce the political terms of, uh, uh, of nation, the constitutional court in Madrid, uh, uh, let's say, abolished the new statute of Catalonia. And this was the origin of the tensions that now divided so deeply Barcelona and Madrid. More or less, it was uh, the attempt of cancelling uh, the autonomy uh, in, uh, for instance, this happened in Serbia. When Serbia cancelled the autonomy of Kosovo, then the result was that at the end of the day, Kosovo became independent. <coughs> and, uh, and similarly, it was for Georgia. When Georgia cancelled the autonomy, legal autonomy, of uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the result was that at a certain point a war erupted and Abkhazia and South Ossetia declared independence and Russia recognized this and protected it. And from this point of view, you, you, see, you see here uh, how uh, the, what was, for instance, a certain state melt in something else. And uh, when you speak with the people, uh, not necessarily they perceive themselves as they perceived themselves 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So all this process led exactly to, led to me to think that if we want to understand this uh, dynamic, we need a comprehensive and synchronic approach to the idea of nation of, and the nationalism, and to see to what extent this, uh, this process is uh, uh, represented and can be represented by the idea of uh, uh, liquidity and uh, fluidity. Because this gave, at least to, uh, to us, some interpretative tools in order to understand uh, certain ideology, why they uh, uh, raised under certain conditions, how they evolved, and how different people claim to belong to the idea of nation and nationalism. But uh, I'm sure that if you know the personalities, for instance, uh, both uh, they claim to be nationalism. Mazzini in Italy, for instance, and Radovan Karadzic in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Serbia. Yeah? But uh, I think that they had two radical different ideas about the nation and what the nation should be, and even how the nation should be established so this is, this is just to explain uh, this sense of uh, transformation that uh, is, uh, uh, is characterizing uh, the idea of nation. And why, under certain conditions, this was a question, and I want to come again, why nation, uh, national state was perceived and is still perceived in the Western world is a bastion of freedom and at the same time uh, can be perceived on the opposite side as uh, a bastion of homogeneity on oppression of minorities or even a factor, a factor that lead to, the, to authoritarianism if not totalitarianism. You yeah. have both this kind of in interpretation. But, you know, there was one key point uh, in my view. Uh, nationalism allowed in Europe first to cut one of the basic uh, idea of how to legitimize the political power. Legitimization through the French Revolution moved from God that legitimized the kings and the imperials to the people. The point was that when you have to define the people, hmm, this is a big issue. Who are the people? The people are those who are paying taxes, only rich people. The people are those who are literate. The people are all, only male. The people are male, female, literate, and illiterate. 
<coughs> these uh, the people correspond also to the different kind of religions or different kind of color of the skin? These are the questions that are related to legitimation of power. And it's explained to you why, for instance, the uh, women got in different time the right to vote. But even the, the male, uh, this was in a different time. And uh, this explains to you why, for instance, a country that is considered very, uh, very democratic, Switzerland, recognized the, the vote to women only in 1972, 71. Turkey in 1934. And uh, the United States of America in 1965 allowed the vote to the black people. So when we are speaking about, uh, about uh, the sense of, uh, uh, of democracy, we have to, to imagine that what does it mean the participation of all the individuals that belong to a certain society participate in the selection of the elite. And when this happened? National state, it's true, cutting this uh, uh, connection between the sovereign and the, and, the, and the God created the condition for the developing of, uh, uh, of democracy. There are no doubts from this point of view. But it's also true that the national state uh, created monsters like Nazism. And Nazism was particularly problematic for all, for several reasons. Also because uh, he tried to invent uh, through eugenetic the, uh, the uh, most uh, uh, superior uh, man uh, because of the emphasis of Aryanism, all these issues. But Nazism, manipulated and used minorities in order to change the borders. And this installed into the countries the idea that minorities are disloyal. The case of München and Czechoslovakia is clear. But this, this has been strengthened, by, by, the, by the way. And this kind, of, imagine this kind of homogeneity that was imposed already in 1920, for instance, in Italy. Italy, when included the Sub-Tirol, inhabited by a majority of Austrians, and, uh, uh, and Istria, Istria and the city of Zadar, where the majority were set up by Slovenians and Croats, the Italian government, already the, the, uh, the liberal government, but then systematically the fascist government imposed to everybody to change name and surnames. And this imposition was because they wanted to restore the Latin origin of the uh, names and surnames of the people that were changed by the perfect Austro-Hungarian Empire that used the Slavs against the Latin culture. The same argument was used by the communist Todor Zhivkov in Turkey against, against uh, in, sorry, in Bulgaria, against the Turkish, the Turkish uh, minority in the 80s. And this forced, for instance, the people, Turkish people to leave Bulgaria and, uh, exactly in 1986-89, yes, during that time. So this is explained, this kind of homogeneity that was imposed, uh, for instance, is something that is putting into question the idea of democracy. <coughs> if democracy means that we have to cope with the diversities within a society. Diversity that starts from the fact that we have at least two genders. And we have to cope to, uh, to that, because you know very well. The question is a question of mediation between the two genders. This starts already in the family. So I think that, and since the family is one of the core of all our social uh, organizations, it's obvious that this mirrored then into, into the uh, idea of the nation. And so uh, for all these reasons, I, uh, I was thinking that liquidity and, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, sort of, I can say, of uh, uh, yes, fluidity, fluidity is uh, characterizing uh, not only the role of nationalism in our time, our time as such, and as an impact even on the way how democracy is perceived. And this is a great challenge, particularly for your generation, because 
for my generation, more or less, the time is coming to over. But uh, for your generation, means exactly to cope with, uh, with diversities and to know that this diversity is within the individuals and within the, individual and within the societies. And this is uh, a great challenge how to manage this diversity. Thank you for your attention.